This is this is Angler Dave down here at Henson Creek in southern Prince George's County. Watson, you should see the one that just got away here. If that sounds a little bit fishy, uh, your suspicion is right because we're going to tell you some fish stories today, but these are real. Down here just offside uh, Indian Head Highway, it's very close to the highway, we're in a different world. The creek back here is filled with fish. We're going to tell you today about some of the fish that are found in Maryland, how you can catch them. If you've got a simple pole like I've got here, something a little bit more elaborate. We'll tell you how to preserve your fish and tell you why some of the fish are disappearing here in Maryland. We'll tell you something about stream ecology. Now right behind me here is a huge contraption. Looks difficult to make, but it's not. And to tell us about it, we have Martin Tillette, a naturalist and a teacher at the Howard B. Owen Science Center. Martin, what is this thing you've made for us? Well, this is simply what's called a lift net, Dave, and it's just made out of some poles that were cut down from some trees right here out of the woods close by. Mm -hmm. As you can see, I'm going to lift to see if we have a fish, but right. at this time, nothing at this dip. The rest of the net is just made up out of a regular uh, one-inch mesh nylon net mm -hmm. attached to some steel rods and we simply it's a net that sits flat on the bottom I let it sink down and then I position my lifting pole and periodically we'll go back and lift to check to see if I can pick up fish that are hopefully passing over as they make their way upstream to lay eggs. Now, you've been coming to this creek since you were, uh, since you were a child, right, That's Martin? correct. Probably six or seven years old was my first trip down here. And uh, so I'd say you're a professional angler, and you can see even the pros who know the stream well sometimes come up empty, so fishing takes a lot of patience. The fish are smart. They know what to do. They're trying to avoid these traps many times. And no, this is fresh water, is it not, Martin? That's correct. This is fresh, fresh water. Fresh water. But the fish were here to study are saltwater fish. That's correct. These are fish that we call anadromous fish. That means that they live their adult life in the ocean, mm -hmm. but they make their way from the ocean, uh, the Atlantic Ocean in this case, up the Chesapeake Bay, eventually up the Potomac River, mm -hmm. and then feeder streams such as Henson Creek, which feeds directly into the Potomac River. And they come here once a year, usually in the spring, sometime from uh, mid-April till mid-May, and this is the time that they're uh, mating males and female fish laying their eggs mm -hmm. and uh, then the eggs will hatch and then we have what we call fry and the fry or the larval form of the fish will make the journey back down the stream into the river back to the bay and by next fall we'll be back in the Atlantic Ocean again until well, we they reach know, maturity. Uh, we know the story of the salmon. That's I know correct. a lot of the st students study the migration of the salmon. We know what the, when the si salmon migrate and they spawn, the adults then die. Does that happen to the fish that come to this stream? No, these fish uh, Why don't, you show don't us experience what you've got. that. In Let's fact, see some of the fish. Some of the fish that we have here that I've been catching, the one that I'm really after today is the herring. This is called the Atlantic blueback herring. Well, you can tell, see the blue back there. That's aptly it's, named. It's a blue That's a coloring. Big fish. It's a fairly good sized fish. It's uh, been caught here historically by the Native Americans that lived here in Prince George's County uh, as far back as perhaps 2,000 years ago and was very frequently caught by people during the colonial period. Mm -hmm. And uh, even today, many people come to these streams this time of the year, as I am here today, to catch these fish. I like, to, I enjoy them for many purposes. I eat them, but I also use them for <laughs> animal food at the uh, Science Center, and we use them for uh, study programs where we do fish dissection with students. So okay. we get a lot of use out of these fish. Let me see that fish for a moment, Martin. Now, uh, this fish seems to be designed perfectly, has a torpedo shape to it. Now, you called it a blueback herring. That's we can correct. see these shiny uh, scales here on its back. But this fish is adapted to life in the ocean, in the ocean, not here in the stream. What can you tell the students who are watching about this fish? What special features? What makes this fish unique? And what keeps it safe in the ocean? Well, first, as you mentioned, its shape. It uh, has that very streamlined shape. It's one of the it's a very fast swimmer. Mm -hmm. It also travels in large schools. Uh, schools may number in the tens of thousands sometimes. Fish and, go to school, Martin? Well, in that sense, they <laughs> congregate together in large groups. And there's actually safety in numbers because predators are often confused. If they're in a large school and if a predator is coming from below, these fish have a silvery side and bottom. And one of the things that they use to escape their enemies is, is they move through the water they can flash back and forth and that shimmering mm -hmm. look in the water will then confuse a predator and will miss grabbing at the prey what they're going for. It's almost like when you look in the sky and an airplane is coming over and the sun hits it the reflection, the reflection from that back. aluminum That's would correct. put off a predator. Now it's light on the bottom Mm -hmm. but it's dark on the top. How does that protect the fish from enemies? Well again uh, there are a lot of um, 
seabirds that would try to eat these herring, that would catch them. Mm -hmm. But again, if you know from even experiences out in the Chesapeake Bay or the ocean, the water from above when you're looking down is usually a dark greenish color. Mm -hmm. And so they're difficult to spot from above looking down. So this enables them, again, to escape, escape detection from above. Okay. Uh, now you have some smaller fish over there, Martin, other than the herring. What other fish live here in Maryland? Can you show us? Well, these particular fish that I have here, again, are like the uh, herring. They're anadromous fish. Mm -hmm. They live in the ocean. These are called Atlantic silversides, and they're here just for that purpose alone. These they're, fish don't like being handled, Martin. They no, get back no, they want to the get back into pool. the swimming pool. <laughs> but Again, they're so named because of their very brilliant silver side. Look at that. Now, how can and you tell the difference between a male and a female? Now, you say they come here to spawn, uh, and then the fry after the eggs hatch are mm -hmm. going to go back downstream. What's inside? Well, it looks like this one is full. Would there be eggs inside here? If how it's can you a tell? female, what I would do is squeeze the stomach and no, see what comes out. Fish, no, it? it isn't going to hurt the fish. In this case, I'm not seeing anything, so we'll try another fish. Okay. But I think. If it's a female, we say the term we use is gravid. That means she'll mm -hmm. be filled with eggs. This one here happens to be a male. Some milk came out. Okay. Uh, that would be the semen. Okay, that's the male uh, reproductive cells that are coming up. They'll correct. fertilize the eggs. That's correct. And if we can find a female, we can squeeze her, okay. and some eggs should come out. Okay, okay. this one had a few eggs come out. Okay, now, now what are those eggs called? The eggs are referred to as row. How do you spell that, Mark? That would be spelled R-O-E. So it's not like mm -hmm. rowing your boat. No, it's, not at all. That's R-O-W. Now, the larger fish also have row in them, and we know that some people come here to Henson Creek specifically to catch the fish because they like to eat the fish eggs. You might have heard of caviar before. Well, this is a different kind of caviar. It's all the eggs still inside the sack. Let's have a look at what those row uh, look like. Let's see, Mark. Okay, this is Again, a female blueback herring, mm -hmm. and much of the body cavity, as you can see, is just filled with the Look row. And that. there are tens of thousands of eggs right in here. Mm -hmm. Just behind the row is the swim bladder the fish has, and this is when the animal's alive, filled with water to enable it to remain buoyant in the water. Now, all but of the, these intestines and internal organs, when you go to the supermarket to get fish, this is all taken out when it's clean. That's generally removed. But today, this is very popular. People buy just the row. Sometimes the row is available in the supermarket as an item that you can buy independent of the fish. Okay. So we've got herring in this creek that you can catch. We've got Atlantic Silverside, shad. You've heard of shad roe, perhaps. That's a delicacy. People like to eat the eggs of the shad. Any other fish that may be coming up the creeks and the streams here in Prince George's that students might be able to catch? And by the way, you need a fishing license, do you not, to catch these fish? If you're over 16 years in age, you need to have a fishing license for Maryland 16. waters. Okay, That's so a lot of you are going to be able to get all the fish you want and not have to worry about a license. Any other species that we should know about? Well, there are a lot of fish that live here in this creek year-round, and they're the uh, native species. We have bluegill uh, a little further down the creek where it's darker. I mean, deeper you'll have um, uh, bass, largemouth and smallmouth bass. Mm -hmm. uh, yellow perch come in here earlier, usually in March, and they're also in the creek to spawn. White perch, um, occasionally even black crappie are seen in this uh, stream. So there's a variety of fish available here. A lot of different kinds of fish and certainly if you go to the library you could find a whole listing probably with pictures to help you identify what it is you're after. So you're having a good time, you're learning about nature and maybe you're getting some dinner for the table as well. Mom's going to appreciate that. One more thing Martin before we leave this great setting here. Uh, what about the streams themselves? We know that the fish population has been declining for many years. What is it about the way we live that's affecting the fish adversely. Are we polluting the streams and how are we doing it? Well, we're polluting the streams in many ways. Uh, this stream has a lot of uh, what we call litter. People have thrown trash into the stream. That's typical. Tires Probably, and Yeah, all. tires and um, you'll just find anything and everything sometimes in these streams. Probably the greatest thing that's a potential threatening to streams today are plastics and people, mm. how they deal with plastics in terms of disposing them. Because they don't degrade, uh, They don't do degrade, they? they don't decompose. And so they're here. Once they're in the system, they're there to stay. But uh, a lot of things that add to problems with the streams is just pe how people do their lawn care mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the use of pesticides and herbicides. And many of the pesticides they spray to kill insects if they find their way into the watershed will kill larval fish forms. They'll kill the uh, newly hatched fry of these fish that we just looked at here. Mm -hmm. And that probably presents the greatest threat to these 
young, early fish in these streams. So the environment is very delicate and what we do in one area affects other things and sometimes we're not even aware of it. That's it's correct. It's an intricate food web so the things you spray in your lawn eventually might kill, well they'll kill the insects but they may also kill something that you'd like to keep alive like the fish in this stream here. Martin, thanks a lot for taking the time to show us all these uh, fish and uh, I hope he's going to give us some of these to take back Watson. I promise I'll bring something back and uh, uh, like I say the one that got away was probably about uh, about this big. Do herring get this big Martin? Not quite that big. <laughs> Watson we're going to come back and share this with you. Gee, look at all the neat fish I got. Mr. Z is really going to be surprised. Look, I got one fish and two fish and three fish and my hey, goodness, Watson. Right. Yeah. Oh, hi, Mr. Z. You missed the boat this morning. Well, I sat I off. waited and waited and waited. I what did you do? Front. Did you sleep in? No, I waited for a boat to come by, and you I never saw one. You waited for the boat to come. Uh-huh. Whoa, you did better than we did. Yep. Look at this catch you've got in the net. Yeah. Where'd you get all these fish? Well, I went to school to get those. You went to school to get uh -huh. the fish. What school gave you these fish? Oh, I went to Columbia Park Elementary School. Oh, they provided yeah. you with these? Yeah. No, we saw some fish this morning. Uh -huh. We saw some specialized fish. They had big names, anadromous kinds of fish that live in salt water and come up and breed in the fresh water. Oh. What? Like fish here in Maryland, uh, shad, herring. Um, well, salmon does that, doesn't Salmon it? does yeah. that as well. We were looking at baby fish, little fry. We looked at the row inside, but we saw nothing wait, like wait, wait. this. Wait, wait, little fry? Little fry. Oh, gee. You mean you cook them? You cook them. Now, Watson, don't get any ideas here. We're here to talk about the fish. We're not trying to scare them off. Oh, okay. Now, what kind of fish is this? That's one that has hair like me. It sure does. Look at it. almost matches there. <laughs> this fish has a mane on the top uh -huh. instead of a fin. Now, this is a fish out of water. And since this program is about adaptations, certain features that suit fish to their particular environment, I'm afraid this fish isn't going to make it. Now, this mane on the top here makes him look like a lionfish, uh -huh. but uh, we're looking for a fin. We're not looking for hair on the top. Sorry, fella. We're going to have to throw you back in. Oh, gee. Now, what about this one? Yep. Boy, is this a beautiful fish. Yep. Watson, it's got it's feathers. Got feathers yeah, on it's got the feathers side. on it. Just is this a flying fish? Could be. It, well, of course, real flying fish do exist, but they have scales instead of feathers. Now, what would happen if a fish did have feathers instead of scales? What happens to feathers when they get wet? Well, gee. They get soggy. The yeah. fish would sink to the bottom. Uh huh. I guess uh, you've heard of chicken of the sea? Yeah. Well, if there really were a chicken. Nah, chick chickens can't swim. <laughs> chickens can't nah. swim very well because feathers get wet. Feathers are not a good appendage for a fish. They need a scale because it's water repellent and lets that fish glide through the water like it should. Sorry, fella. Okay, just like Charlie the tuna, we can't take you. This one's oh. going back in, too. I'm and look sorry. at this guy. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful fish, and he's got on glasses. He looks like Mr. Magoo. Yeah, he kept banging to the side of the aquarium. Okay, he must be nearsighted. Yeah. Now, of course, fish don't need glasses. They can't go to the optician because their eyes are specially adapted to look through the water without any distortion. Now, if they needed glasses, that would be very tough to keep them on while they were swimming through water. Great looking fish, but sorry, fella, you don't make it either. Oh, Back gee. in the water. Well, see what else we got. Ah, uh, this one. This one needs a razor. Yeah, it just needs a little shave, that's all. Yeah, he's got uh, some uh, hair above his lip here. Now, some of you know that swimmers, competitive swimmers in the Olympics, shave their bodies. They remove their hair to make them go through the water with less drag. Makes them a little bit more smooth as they go through. So this guy, you're not going to escape your, your enemies too easily if you've got some hair on your face. So this one, too, is another fish out of water. Watson. I don't know where you got these. The kids at Columbia Park made some beautiful examples to show you how fish shouldn't look. We oh. saw how fish did look and should look down at the creek. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some fish that I know you're familiar with. Well, Tropical fish. Well, I guess I'll just take these fish back to school, Mr. Z. If you Z. take them back to school and teach them a lesson, you'd be doing them a favor. Okay. When we come back, we'll show you how to set up an aquarium and how to make your fish feel like they're right at home. Yeah, Stay we'll back tuned. to school. Okay. We're back and as promised we have an aquarium here and it's all set up and filled with fish and to help us find out how to set up an aquarium and what kind of fish to choose and how to take care of them to keep them looking as good as they do now, we have Cindy Nowak who is a veterinary technician and she's also the pet care specialist at the Dr. Pet Center in Landover Mall. And Cindy's here to give us all the answers on what we need to know about aquarium care. Cindy, thanks for coming by. Thank you for having me. Now, our program thus far has talked about adaptations, how fish are best 
best suited to their particular environment. Now these are these are tropical fish, aren't they? Yes, Dave, they are. And that means, I suppose, that they come from tropical areas on Earth, the right. Amazon River Basin, where it's warm year-round. Exactly. Now, how is it? How is it, Cindy, that we can keep these fish here in Maryland where it's temperate year-round and make them feel like they're still at home? What do you need? Well, Dave, today we have a 10-gallon tank here, and we have it with all tropical fish. Mm -hmm. um, what we do basically to keep them comfortable and keep them alive in this area is we heat the water. That keeps them familiar with their surroundings. And it's important that the water be kept between 70 and 80 degrees for a tropical fish to live in it. Okay. Uh, we also put gravel on the bottom. That makes them feel a little bit more comfortable. Then we put plants. They find plants in their natural surroundings. We also give natural airflow by a pump or, and we... So that's what these bubbles are for here. Right. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a filter underneath then, Cindy? Yes, Dave. Now, uh, the filter keeps the water clear. Is it important that the, the clarity be good so that the fish can see where they're going? It's very important. Um, also, the clarity of the water will keep bacterial growth down, will keep mm -hmm. fungus from growing, and that's very important. So that's, I remember when I was uh, a kid and I had an aquarium, I kept the water for a few days before putting it in. Now, do you need to do that, or is there something you can do to speed it up? Nowadays, there's things you can do much faster than that. You, there's a product called chlorine neutralizer. Chlorine, and, ne chlorine is a chemical? Mm-hmm. Okay. And this is, neutralizes the chlorine balance in the water. So as soon as you get your fish, you mm -hmm. just let the bag sit on top of the water for a while. Make sure you're already f the f tank is already filled up. You put, I think it's one drop per 10 gallons, the mm -hmm. directions are on the back of the bottle, and then you can just put your fish straight into the water. You don't have to wait three or four days like you used to have Okay, to. all right, that, yeah, that takes us back a well, while. We didn't have those when I was growing up. <laughs> so we've got clear water, we're providing oxygen for the fish, we're warming the water so they feel like they're right back at home. Uh, what about light? Is it necessary that you have a light for your aquarium? Right, just like in their natural surroundings, they have daylight. Mm -hmm. um, we provide light by a hood, and that helps lots of things with the fish. It helps them make them feel more comfortable. They're in, they can see each other. It helps a lot with their growth and color, too. I see. Now, we're going on as if everybody knows what's in this tank. They're obviously fish. What kind of fish are they, Cindy? Can you help us out with some names? Yeah, well, today we have some goldfish. These big orange ones are goldfish. And this mm -hmm. is a Siamese fighting fish right over here. And we have some neons in this little bunch. And these are swordfish right over here. And what's the one that has like the green stripes on? It looks like it's clear, almost like a plate glass. Those are called painted glass fish. Painted glass very fish. Very interesting. Now, of all the fish in here, if there's a student out there watching and saying, boy, I'd like to have one of these, uh, what fish is tolerant to a lot of different conditions, the toughest of the bunch? I think the best starter fish would be a goldfish. Goldfish. We've they got don't a couple require in here. a lot of, a super lot of care, and if you can't get a heater, they're the only fish that will live in a tank that doesn't need to be heated. Oh, that's good advice. Now, what about space, Cindy? Uh, do you have to have a big tank for fish? What's a, what's a rule of thumb if the students are wondering, how big a tank should I get for the fish I want? Well, you can have fish in a small tank. I would say one fish per gallon of water. Mm -hmm. This is a 10-gallon tank. We have a little bit more than 10 fish in here, but 10 fish would be ideal. Okay, so I hope you remember what Cindy said. One fish per gallon is a good rule of thumb if you're out there shopping for an aquarium. Uh, what about all the nice things you've got in here? You've got some seaweed, you've got uh, decoration. Is that important for the fish? Do they like to live in a nice neighborhood because it looks good? Well, the color isn't so much important. Um, that's more of the owner's preference. Um, plants are nice, though. They do, that's preferred. That brings them out to their natural surroundings. That's what I they were see. brought up in is with plants around. But there are all kinds of plants you can put in, all kinds of varieties of toys and little villages they can hide mm -hmm. in doesn't really matter to them. <laughs> so the toys in there are more for you and me. They're not so much for the fish. The fish really are, are interested in having enough oxygen, uh, a space to swim around, and of course they need food. We haven't talked about food, Cindy. Sometimes I know we tend to overfeed fish. Yes, yes. What's a good advice, what good advice could you give to students on how often to feed fish and what to give them? You feed your fish once a day. And you have to be careful not to overfeed your fish. They just need a little pinch sprinkled just across the top of the tank. Mm -hmm. If you do overfeed, your tank will become foggy, and that's not good for them. All right, we want to have it looking as good as it does right now, nice and clear. Uh, we've heard about fish called algae eaters. Mm -hmm. Now, algae sometimes starts to grow in a tank, and you see that green bloom. Will algae eaters take care of the problem? They'll help some of the problem. 
but just one algae eater won't take care of the entire problem. But they're fun fish to have around, All too. All right, so that's something to add. We don't have one here today. And before we leave, um, if you're interested in becoming a veterinary technician, as Cindy is, what could you tell students about a future career? Did you always grow up loving animals oh, and fish I did. in particular? My whole family had animals. Um, once you're out of high school and you've graduated, you can contact a counselor at any local community college, and there's a two to four year course you can take to become a certified veterinary technician. I see. Thanks, Cindy. Thank so you. if you want to follow in her footsteps, you know what to do and go out and get yourself an aquarium. It's not that expensive if you start small. Thanks for joining us today on Give Science a Hand. Uh, Watson's probably gone fishing. We hope to see you here on Give Science a Hand next time. Bye-bye. It's just me, 